Hello, everybody. Thanks all for rejoining for the uh, second session of uh, day two. So in this, uh, in this session, we're going to be hearing from the potential users of Hydro GNSS. Uh, our chairs for this session are Giuseppe Fotti, who's a senior research scientist at National Oceanographic Centre. And we have Paul Blunt, who's an uh, associate professor of GNSS and communications and engineering at the University of Nottingham. So over to the chairs. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. Um, so I will introduce the first speaker of this session, session two of day two of this workshop. And it's uh, Meres Zribi, who is with SESBIO. And he's going to be talking to us about the Genesis R activities over land surfaces, which are being uh, run at uh, SESBIO. Over to you, Meres. Okay, thank you very much. I share my slides. I hope. Is it okay? Do you see my slides? Yeah, we can. Okay, so we begin. So, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for. Uh, presentation. So uh, the presentation here is to, uh, to present particularly activities uh, concerning uh, CSBU activities uh, with GNSS for uh, land surface use. These activities have particularly developed with uh, other partners like uh, Sapienza University. So CSBU activities concern land surface functioning in the context of uh, climate and uh, anthropogenic change. And uh, we use, of course, uh, satellite data, multi-sensor satellite data, active and passive uh, microwaves, and also of the, uh, optical data to uh, describe different land surface parameters in the context of uh, water and uh, carbon cycles and uh, describing uh, these parameters generally as input for different uh, processing models to describe uh, land surface process. So for Genesis R activities, I can uh, uh, present them in three parts. The first one concerning the use of airborne Genesis R measurements uh, for different uh, land surface properties. The second part will be uh, Cygnus applications for desertic regions. And we have also some applications to retrieve soil moisture. Today, I just present uh, these two first points uh, for uh, application with uh, uh, airborne measurements and uh, for application with Cygnus. So uh, the instrument that we develop in CSBO called the GLORY, it's a polarimetric instrument. So we have uh, the, the left and the right polarization uh, estimated from uh, the instrument. We use uh, the Research France, uh, the French- uh, so, Sorry to interrupt. It seems like the slides aren't updating. I don't know if- um... That seems to be the case for other people as well on the chat. Um, maybe if you try to stop sharing and reshare, it might might uh, come back to life. Ah, yeah. Is it okay now? I can see it moving now. Yeah, try try to go full screen again. I hope it will work. You're not in the presenter mode, yes. Ah, okay, okay, okay. I see that. I think. Uh, uh, let me... Uh, uh, it it uh, seems to freeze when you go to the. <laughs> yeah, I just see the uh, little circle going here. Yeah. It was updating it was, just when you had it on the PowerPoint slide, but. Uh, if it's complicated, I try just to. Uh, yeah, we can we can change see slides, there, I suppose. Yeah. Manually. Yeah, that's fine. okay. So, uh, sorry, uh, I think there is a, so glory instrument. So as I said, it's polarimetric. So we have, we usually the, the French at air uh, research uh, aircraft to do these measurements. And uh, we see here the structure of the glory measurements with uh, these, uh, uh, the two antennas and uh, Nadir antenna and Zenith antenna and all the system uh, that uh, combine measurements of uh, the glory instrument and all parameters coming from the aircraft concerning uh, position and other parameters. 
So this is uh, the type of measurement that we developed. We developed in 2015 uh, important uh, ground measurements, uh, airborne measurements to analyze uh, properties for agricultural surfaces and also forest in the southwest of France in the areas of uh, uh, land forests. So we see here the, uh, these typical uh, measurements, for example, in the, in the, in the land forest with different uh, glory uh, uh, transects with measurements and different ground measurements that are made in different types of uh, uh, density of vegetation cover. The objective is to analyze uh, biomass uh, for this area. Biomass in this area is between zero and 150 uh, uh, ton per, per hectare. And also analysis of uh, properties, particularly soil moisture in the surfaces and agricultural surfaces. Okay, so when we see uh, data distribution, we observe uh, this uh, distribution of uh, left uh, uh, gamma reflectivity. And we see, of course, uh, the, the highest signals corresponding to water covers. Then we see agricultural covers. And finally, we see the forest areas. For all, each of them, we develop different uh, 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 scientific studies to analyze for forest biomass, for agriculture, particularly soil moisture, and for water studies about altimetry. And we see here the typical uh, uh, mapping when we mean values at 200 meter by 200 meter pixels. And we see the structure that we can observe, particularly for uh, important size of uh, fields for agricultural areas, uh, particularly irrigated agricultural uh, fields, uh, which is uh, with uh, these circular uh, uh, forms that we retrieve in the GNSSR measurements. So for the first uh, analysis concerning soil moisture, we work in analysis of sensitivity of uh, particularly left uh, uh, polarization, received polarization, and we develop a, a semi-empirical model that link reflectivity to uh, surface properties, of course, linking soil moisture, but also properties due to vegetation. And we see here calibration of the model, and then we see here the retrieved soil moisture with the inversion of this type of model with an RMS error about 6% uh, uh, as volumetric moisture. So here also, when we talk about uh, GNSSR, of course, the potential to go to the synergy between uh, uh, GNSSR data and all types of data like optical data, for example, for uh, vegetation description that could be useful even for satellite measurements. For sensitivity to uh, biomass, we have also uh, uh, high potential to retrieve this uh, biomass. It was presented, of course, yesterday in a global context. We retrieved that for two types of uh, observables, the left polarization uh, reflectivity, but also the ratio between left and right polarization. And we retrieve approximately the same RMS error, showing in this case also the potential when you have uh, these uh, polarimetric measurements that could be very useful, particularly for vegetation, where we generally we reduce the effect of soil moisture using uh, this ratio. This is very quick illustration of other measurements that we developed in July 2021, and that show also the, the right reflectivity, which is uh, with lower level comparing to the left uh, reflectivity. But when we see this area with irrigated area and the dry area, we see clearly the difference even with the right polarization reflectivity and the potential of this polarization to add uh, other uh, informations in inversion of land surface properties. So uh, after this uh, presentation of uh, airborne measurements, I go to Cygnus applications for desertic areas. Uh, applications are generally concerning two types of parameters. First, the aerodynamic roughness, and uh, for different uh, models concerning uh, climate uh, uh, modeling and uh, evolution of uh, aerosols. 
And the second point, the subsurface behavior, the observation of fossil rivers, for example, that was developed uh, in many cases by uh, L-band uh, SAR data. So we consider measurements in the Sahara, in the, the biggest deserts in the world. And we have, uh, we consider all measurements that we have uh, with Cygnus data. We see, of course, the behavior of DDM with uh, uh, these type of DDM with the flat surfaces, for example, in Sudan, uh, more important uh, scattering uh, behavior for uh, uh, this area. And of course, when we are in the mountain areas, we have the more important scattering. And then uh, these, uh, uh, this typical DDM for these uh, surfaces. For, for analysis of uh, data, for Cygnus data, we propose uh, analysis as objective to propose the reflectivity with the highest resolution, spatial resolution as possible. So we consider three steps. The first one, to look for the possible normalization of data because we have uh, different elevation angles and we can have some small effect due to these uh, uh, elevation angle. The second point, verify stability of Cygnus data in the context of the de desert, which was validated in the past with uh, SAR data. We have a very limited variation uh, in this context without uh, vegetation development and also without uh, any soil moisture change. And finally, proposing the reflectivity mapping. So we see here, when we talk about stability of signal, it is validated, clearly validated with the uh, uh, reflectivity. This is left reflectivity. See in these two areas in the Kufra and uh, in Libya and Algeria for dunes, and this is flat surface. We see a very low RMS uh, standard deviation uh, with a very stable signal during all the studied periods of about two years and a half. Then we look for when we consider a mean level of signal for one pixel, because we consider this uh, uh, to grill, to consider a separation in pixels. And for each pixel, we mean all the signals measured by Cygnus during uh, two years and a half. And then we try to analyze stability also of this variation uh, function of uh, the scale of these uh, uh, grids. And we find that approximately 3003 degree seems uh, coherent to propose a stable signal with a clear, uh, uh, good accuracy for uh, observations. So we see here this uh, uh, final mapping based in these uh, three steps with uh, this resolution of uh, about three kilometers. We find uh, very interesting structures uh, due particularly to mountains, to dunes. And uh, we talk after that also to subsurface. So it is comparing to the first scale, uh, the resolution is very, very interesting uh, comparing to the uh, other low, low resolution like uh, scatulometer, for example. So the idea, the first one is to see if there is any potential of penetration of uh, these signals uh, uh, to see, to observe subsurface. Of course, we have approximately the same frequency as uh, uh, L-band SAR data, like uh, ELOS data and uh, uh, other results proposed by CERCI in the past. So we try to find, to retrieve uh, these same uh, behaviors in other sites studied in the past. So we consider these two sites in the Kufra in Libya, which is a very known uh, site with the fossil river and also in Sudan. And we see uh, here the results for the Kufra basin with very interesting results, I think, because uh, even we have not the same resolution, of course, here we have uh, ALOS data with uh, uh, very fine resolution, about 20 meters. And we see here the resolution of three kilometers. And in spite of, despite this uh, degradation in terms of resolution, we retrieve different structures of these uh, uh, fossil river that is not, of course, uh, observed at the surface. This is a zoom of the same area. We see here these uh, structures, of course, degraded, but we can observe these uh, structures due to this uh, fossil river in this, uh, in this uh, illustration of uh, left reflectivity. 
the same thing here also other surface subsurface areas with the uh, geo um, morphological structures that are also observed here clearly uh, in these two illustrations and that are also retrieved with Cygnus data and I think uh, they are very very clearly uh, illustrated so this is the first qualitative uh, analysis and then we try to analyze uh, aerodynamic reflectivity aerodynamic uh, roughness, which is uh, directly linked to geometry, and uh, the definition is written here, the height above the displane at which the mean wind becomes zero when extrapolating the logarithmic with speed profile downward through the surface layer. So other studies in the past, and uh, I participate to some studies, we see a very uh, high correlation between radar signals like scatterometer and this parameter, and we try to do the same thing we signal data. And the results are illustrated here from different ground measurements that we proposed we did in the past. We see here the left reflectivity, and we see here the sigma coming from ALOS data. And we see clearly the very interesting correlation between reflectivity and these parameters. You observe approximately the same type of behavior, but of course it is inverse. Here, when we increase uh, roughness, of course, we decrease the reflectivity. And inversely, when we increase the roughness, we increase the monoscattering, the backscattering behavior of radar. So finally, we propose a type of mapping of this aerodynamic roughness. We developed it in the past 15 years ago with the ERS scatter meter. And we consider four classes of uh, uh, aerodynamic roughness. The objective is, of course, to consider this type of mapping as inputs for aerosol modeling. I think that's all. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope if there is any question, don't hesitate. Thank you. Thank you, Merit. Um, over to uh, Paul for questions and answers. Yeah, thank you very much for a really interesting presentation. Thank you so much. Um, let's have a look. Yeah, so I think it was a, a question I had as, as well as what um, uh, that's come up. What, what was the spatial resolution of the the airborne data that you're um, yes. that you're using? Yeah, so uh, because a lot of us are maybe familiar with the satellite stuff, but not so much. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, concerning the airborne measurements, of course, it depends on the altitude. So uh, typically, when we uh, use uh, these flights at 600 meter, we have uh, uh, polygons or uh, the, the, the cells after integration, uh, because there is two steps, uh, current and uh, uncoherent integrations. We have approximately at 20, uh, between 20 and 30 meters as the scale of the, these units in the field scale. So generally we, we mean these uh, cells to have the mean level at uh, field scale, of course, for example, in uh, July 2021, we have flights at 1,200 meters. In this case, we have approximately between 70 and 80 meters as a minimum resolution. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's uh, very useful. I don't see any others in the chat. Oh, yeah. Um, do you have a publication with the results of the airborne mapping? Yes, yes, of course. There are, I think, uh, four or five publications that uh, I can send to all persons interested by these results. Yeah, well, yeah, if you send to us, we'll, um, we'll share it with the participants. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, one other question I had was related to um, the resolution was just the, uh, the three, is it three kilometers you mentioned for Cygnus? Is that something that just comes out of the data that it's gridded in that way? Or is that something that you, you have control over in some way? Or? I think the, the difficulty, of course, we, uh, we have the cells uh, with uh, this uh, uh, structure of about uh, seven kilometers. When we consider we use integrated uh, and coherent signal at one second. So the idea why we can go to this fine resolution, because we have the, the stability of the signal and we can consider the maximum of data at small area. Of course, if you are in context of soil moisture at higher resolution, with uh, at higher temporal resolution, with the continuous evolution, it will be, I think, more complicated to go to this resolution if you have not enough satellites to, to
to have the maximum of measurements at one day or what, one week to, to go to this uh, type of resolution and to, to have uh, more precision in the, uh, in the surface uh, structures. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, and thank you for wonderful presentation. Yeah, um, Giuseppe, shall we? Um, uh, uh, yeah, I think we're on time. Yeah, so maybe move on to the next. Yeah, we are on time, and uh, I'm going to introduce the next speaker, who is uh, Clément Arberger, who is a climate scientist with ESA. He's going to be talking about uh, the ESA CCI program and integration of new data. Over to you, Clément. Good morning. Thank you, Giuseppe. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's fine. We can see your slides. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you for the introduction. I'm indeed a climate application uh, scientist working at the European Space Agency Climate Office in the UK, and I focus on terrestrial uh, activities. And under the Climate Change Initiative of ESA, I supervise different projects linked to soil moisture, fire, lakes, vegetation parameters, as well as a cross ECB project on regional uh, carbon budget. So this talk is for me the opportunity to give you a broad overview of the ESA Climate Change Initiative, the rationale behind it, and illustrating some of the different uh, projects we have that I believe could benefit from GNSS technology, data such as from uh, hydro uh, GNSS. But first, uh, some background. Climate change is arguably the greatest environmental challenge facing us in the 21st century, and the consequences of a warming climate are far reaching. And with worsening impacts predicted for the natural environment and society for generations to come, climate change is high on political, strategic, and economic agendas worldwide. The IPCC has released last August the key finding of the Working Group 1 contribution to the sixth assessment report on the physical science basis of climate change. The report provides new estimates of the chances of crossing the global warming level of 1.5 degrees Celsius in the next decades and find that unless there are immediate, rapid, and large scale reduction in greenhouse gas emission, limiting warming to close to 1.5 degrees even, or even 2 degrees will be beyond reach. Now, the IPCC is here to provide a scientific assessment of uh, climate change. And combating climate change requires a global effort. The UNFCCC is leading this international effort to combat climate change and limit global warming to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels as set out in the Paris Agreement for Climate. UNFCCC is the body responsible for driving global climate action. And the ultimate objective is to stabilize greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere at a level that will prevent dangerous human interference with the climate system. And to achieve this objective, and to make decisions on climate change, mitigation, and adaptation, the UNFCCC requires a systematic observation of the climate system. It is only with accurate, high-quality observation at sufficient resolution in both time and space that climate science, but also climate services, will progress. And the capabilities of Earth observation satellites in support of climate information needs reflect their unique abilities and benefits. They have wide area observation capability, they are non-intrusive, and provide uniformity, rapid measurement, and continuity. And that is precisely why the role of the European Space Agency is crucial to climate and climate uh, action. In response to the UNFCCC requirements for systematic monitoring of the climate system, ESA launched the Climate Change Initiative, CCI Research Program, in 2010. The CCI is a coordinated research and development program amongst ESA member states. That objective is to generate robust, long-term, global satellite-derived data set for essential climate variable, ECBs. And the CCI does this by harnessing Earth observation archives generated over the last 40 years and combining them with data from both third-party and current missions, including the Copernicus Sentinel mission. Under CCI, we currently have 23 dedicated ECB project teams developing 21 ECBs. As you can see on this slide, each of these projects addresses a specific variables in the oceanic, terrestrial, and atmospheric domains. And we also have horizontal cross ECB activities, such as the Sea Level Budget Project Project and the Recap 2 project on regional carbon budget, as well as a dedicated climate modeling user group 
and the research fellowship program. We will kick off a new project on vegetation parameter, uh, parameters next month. And I believe that soil moisture, uh, but also biomass, fire, snow, and permafrost are the ones, are the ones, the project where Genesis reflectometry could be useful. And I will start by introducing um, soil moisture. As I said uh, earlier, under CCI and later under the future climate program of ESA, we develop ECVs by putting together, by combining first observation archives with data from both third party and current mission. Integrating data from new satellite missions when relevant is at the core of our program. And the CCI soil moisture project is a very good example as it produces annually algorithm, algorithmically uh, updated global climate data record of soil moisture spanning over more than 40 years, ingesting data sets derived from all the sensors listed on this uh, slide. They, have de they developed three separate soil moisture products derived from active, passive, as well as a combination of both active and passive uh, sensors. And to date, they have released 12 uh, data sets, each updated with any available new sensors and extended time series when uh, applicable. Data are available at a quarter degree spatial resolution. And one of the coming challenge will be to develop ways to downscale the existing data so we can have higher spatial resolution, global, long-term soil moisture data. And the soil moisture CCI product uh, has contributed to hundreds of ideological and climatological studies worldwide, as well as the annual Bulletin of American Meteorological Society, the state of the climate report for more than uh, a decade now. And the latest uh, one uh, has been published last year and focused on the year 2020. And here, just for sake of illustration, you have a global map of the average soil moisture anomalies for 2020, expressed in cubic meter per cubic meter with respect to the 1991-2010 base period. But for sake of time, I will not go into the data, the details, and jump uh, directly to the next variable, that is above ground biomass. So above ground biomass, is considered, considered as an essential climate variable due to its functions as both a source of atmospheric CO2 when forest is lost under land use change or by degradation, but also as a sink for CO2 due to forest growth. Information on forest biomass can also play a much wider role in understanding and predicting uh, climate, for example, in model initialization and testing, estimation of carbon turnover, inferring the forest disturbance regime and data simulation in carbon cycle and climate models. And tracking biomass change over time is a useful contributor to the Paris Agreement Global Stock Stake in the context of the National Data Mine Contribution, NDCs, aiming at a better understanding of subdecadal and decadal variability of the carbon cycle, a more robust and transparent reporting in the UNRF C, but also for the overall reliance of natural things for climate mitigation and finally, it also contributes to a better understanding of carbon climate feedbacks, hotspots, and tipping point, as well as ecosystem uh, collapse. <clears throat> New maps providing a global view of a bond ground, ground biomass distribution and spatial density over four separate years have recently been uh, generated, and they have been mentioned in an earlier talk this morning. And they have been derived from a combination of data, depending on the year, from the Copernicus L1 mission, and ESAP's ASA instrument and JAXA's ALOS 1 and ALOS 2, along with um, additional information from Earth observation uh, sources. Now, the team also would like to address temporal consistency, and a possibility could be by integrating additional lower spatial resolution data stream, such as vegetation uh, opacity, VOD, derived for now from ESA's SMOS uh, satellite. And investigating such data set uh, permitted to recently highlight that forest degradation has become the largest process driving carbon loss in the Brazilian uh, Amazon. While both deforestation and forest degradation are damaging to forest health, there is a difference between the two. Uh, deforestation uh, occurs when forests are cleared and converted completely. And when forests are degraded, the health declines and they loss the capacity to support more life and uh, people. And here you can see uh, an animation representing forest loss that is from a recent study published in Nature Climate Change and investigating the dynamics of forest carbon in the Brazilian Amazon uh, over 2010, 2019. And the authors estimated that the Brazilian Amazon experienced a cumulative 
gross loss of carbon that is higher than the gross gain, resulting in a net loss of above ground biomass over the last uh, decade. And this net loss uh, of carbon from the Brazilian Amazon forest, um, 0 0.67 petagram of carbon, is equivalent to seven years of carbon dioxide emission uh, by the UK. Um, right, I've also recently seen a very interesting paper linking GNSS reflectometry and fire disturbance in forests. So I thought I would also present the fire CCI project, even though spatial resolution may be too coarse for hydrogenesis data. It is estimated that about 25 to 35% of greenhouse gas result from biomass burning, and therefore they are considered an important factor in climate change. The fire CCI project focuses on the key variable burn area. And it has different products at global scale, but not only. It has recently focused on high resolution at regional scale for now, using Sentinel-2 information at 20 meters spatial resolution to develop a small fire database covering sub-Saharan Africa. And they have developed this database for 2016 and 2019. And this slide illustrates the small fire data set. As you can see here, for one plot over uh, Australia Africa, the 20 by 20 meters footprint of Sentinel-2 at the bottom right hand side of the slide made it possible to detect way more fires compared to the 500 meter or 250 meter spatial resolution of global product previously used. So you have them in the top two figures. Over Africa and for the year 2016, 90% more small fires were detected with a Sentinel-2 product than with a lower resolution modest product and they contribute to nearly half the total burn area detected. And of, of course, the corresponding fire carbon emission from African fire are clearly higher than previously thought. And this is a substantial increase. Small fires are a critical driver of burn area, at least in sub-Saharan Africa, and including the detected small fires in emission estimates raises the contribution of biomass burning to global greenhouse gas and uh, aerosol. To convince you further of the importance of high resolution when it comes to burn area, on this figure, you have the evolution of the total yearly burn area for different global moderate resolution product. And on the top right part, you have two dots representing the one, the burn area derived from Sentinel data only for sub-Saharan uh, Africa. And you can see that regional burn area are higher than the global one when you consider uh, high resolution. Um, I will change uh, topic and now go to the cryosphere. Uh, the CCI SNOW project focused on development and implementation of methods and processing system to generate consistent multi-sensor time series of global SNOW parameters, namely daily fractional SNOW cover and SNOW water equivalent, and from data of ESA and third-party satellites. And this product contribute to the determination the long-term trend in seasonal snow ice beginning uh, of the early 80s. And the snow extent product here on the left at the spatial resolution of one kilometer and it has a daily coverage. It relies on data from medium resolution optical uh, satellite data, including uh, data from ADHR, ATSER, MODIS, Sentinel-3, uh, AMB. So snow water equivalent uh, production, production system illustrated on the, on the right has been built on the Glob Snow Snow Water Equivalent Production, and it has been further developed by improving various aspects of the processing chain, including time variable snow density, it was fixed before, and also accounting for in the influence of land cover and cloud. The daily global time series is based on CIMER and SSMI, SSMI um, data. Um, in the study illustrated uh, here and published a couple of years uh, ago, the SNOW CCI team has combined 39 years uh, of satellite derived snow mass climate data record with ground based uh, snow depth measurement. And this improved long term climate data record of snow mass has enabled continental scale trends to be investigated. For example, they have concluded that the snow mass has decreased by 46 gigaton per decade across North America. I have discussed with colleagues from the SNOW CCI team who told me that despite of the spatial resolution, they could use and they could be very interested in the hydrogenous data for snow and ice application. One option would be to test the GNSS of the ice sheets during the refreezing phase of the melted surface to estimate the amount of uh, liquid uh, water. Um, jumping now to permafrost, 
the objective of this CCI project is to develop and deliver permafrost maps as ECD product primarily derived from satellite measurement and the required associated parameters by the Global Climate Observing System, GCOS, for the permafrost ECD are the depth of the active layer and the permafrost uh, temperature. So rock glacier kinematics have been proposed as a new parameter and, uh, and are also addressed in the permafrost CCI project. So permafrost cannot be directly observed from space, so they have identified algorithms which can provide these parameters, ingesting a set of global satellite data products in a permafrost model scheme that computes the ground thermal regime. So permafrost CCI strongly relies on data products from recent, ongoing, and future ESA project. And there is now a new 21-year report describing the annual changes to the northern hemisphere permafrost soils from 1997 to 2020 at about one kilometer spatial resolution. And this is the longest satellite permafrost record currently uh, available. So using this data set, a very interesting study has recently been uh, published where authors have tracked the loss of permafrost using satellite data. The active layer, the soil that falls and refreezes seasonally, deepened by an average of 2.5 centimeters across the northern hemisphere during 2007-2016 compared with the previous decade. And for about 5% of the area, the active layer has deepened by more than 30 centimeters. Permafrost is fracturing and disappearing. And the deepening active layer not only destabilizes the landscape, but also makes more carbon available to microbes in the soil, producing more carbon dioxide and uh, methane. So throwing permafrost in the Arctic is already unleashing methane and carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, exacerbating global temperature rise, as well as adding to the climate crisis. This ground, which has been frozen for thousands of years, is becoming unstable and uh, causing serious issues for local communities. And for the first time, data from the Copernicus Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 missions, along with artificial intelligence, have been used to offer a complete overview of the Arctic to identify communities and infrastructures that will be at risk over the next 30 years. The research published in the journal Environmental Research Letters described how the visible traces, traces of human presence or human footprints across the Arctic land, which is prone to thaw, has increased by 15% during the last two decades. And they have used CCI uh, permafrost ground temperature uh, trends going back to 1997, and they have extrapolated them to 2050, allowing to predict where the temperature of the ground down to a depth of two meters will be over zero degrees Celsius by 2050. And we see that 50% of the infrastructure currently located on permafrost and within 100 kilometers of the Arctic coastline, infrastructure on which community relies, is likely to be uh, affected. And being aware uh, of time, um, I wanted to conclude. This was my last slide. And I believe the project that are, I presented several uh, projects under the climate change, the climate sorry, program of ISA that could benefit from GNSS technology in the near future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Clement, for your interesting presentation with an overview of the ISA CCI program. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat at the moment. Perhaps we can wait a couple of minutes, one minute. Happy to answer any question offline as well. Yep, okay. In which case, perhaps we can move on to the next speaker, who is uh, Joaquin Munoz Sabater, and he's working with the ECMWF, and he's gonna be talking to us about the Copernicus Climate Change Services and the ECB services and the future value of uh, hydrogen cells. So Joaquin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. I hope you can see my screen and you can uh, hear me. Can you please confirm? Yes, we can see and yeah, see and hear you. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So thank you very much again. And uh, so I'm uh, Joaquin Munoz and working for uh, ECNWF, which is the European Center for the Medium Range Weather Forecast. And I'm uh, currently leading the ECB program of the Copernicus Climate Change Service. So I'm going to try in the next few minutes to tell you a little bit about uh, this European Climate Service and uh, with focus obviously on the ECB uh, program and see some ideas uh, how the hydrogen um, 
uh, mission could also fit in, in our service uh, as well. So very briefly, because I, I assume everybody already here knows a lot, a lot about the Copernicus program. So apart from the space and the in-situ components of uh, this Earth Observation Program, I think what it makes really interesting, uh, Copernicus, is this, uh, the, the third component, which is the service component uh, more um, oriented towards uh, end users. So we've got six services, three of them are uh, thematic for monitoring different components of the Earth system, which are the marine, the atmospheric composition, and the land. Then we've got the climate change, which is a little bit uh, cross cutting uh, um, around all these uh, three previous ones, obviously with the scope of uh, climate. And then we've got two extra security and energy, emergency manage management with different objectives. So at ECMWF, we are uh, managing the climate change service and the atmospheric composition, but we also uh, contribute actively to the emergency uh, management one. So about C3, so what is this service and offering us? Um, the main objective is to provide uh, access to um, data and climate information. Um, so, which is a, a or, or in support of adaptation and mitigation post policies of the to climate change, and we are talking also about the quality control data, authoritative uh, data, and this is very important um, information because that means that the data that we provide is data that really we can trust. There is a really lot of resources that has been used in order to make sure that not only the data that we provide is of the best quality but also the services that are provided by, by uh, C3S2. Um, the, all the access to the data is done through what we call the climate data store. Uh, so this is one point of, or unique point of access to all the data. Um, whenever a user make a request of some type of data, uh, that doesn't mean that the data has to be necessarily in our archive, but there are a lot of data providers and the data can simply be in their end. And this is a distributed system. And finally, also, we also make examples. So we take some part of the data that's already available in the CDS, open free, uh, which is also quite important. And we try to see how this data can be adapted to several uh, economic sectors to provide them some uh, add value. Um, it's, in other words, we also could pass from uh, what we say the big data. So every day we receive uh, hundreds and millions of observations to to a, a really brief or briefer uh, message, a climate uh, message, which is the type of information which is needed by decision makers in order to take uh, action. So the data that you can find in the, in the climate data store is data about the past, the present and future. Uh, so data about the past, obviously we are talking here about uh, all the satellite uh, archive of, of uh, observations, but I'm talking here rather about level three and level four uh, products, level two also some, somehow, whereas where for the raw uh, data from the satellite, there are other platforms where really a user can uh, download the, um, the data from the Sentinel. So, uh, there's also access to all the uh, networks, in situ networks, very important for validation um, and for other things like a numerical weather prediction too. We have rescue data uh, projects, very important for reanalysis, especially in the pre-satellite era. The reanalysis, we have seen a few slides uh, just a couple of days about ERA-5, um, which is a really the latest generation of reanalysis, providing a very accurate description of the climate of the last uh, decades without gaps in the space or time. And we also look at data of the future. Of course, we've got a uh, seasonal forecast, we've got also projections, uh, decadal projection, or even uh, uh, projections towards the end of the century and even beyond. Um, so now I'll focus a little bit on the on the ECB program. So what we do here is to take all the uh, historical uh, archive of, um, of satellite data for one variable and all this data is harmonized and then a climate data record is a generator. So these climate data records are or provide us the empirical evidence that we need in order to, to understand the changes that uh, our climate are, uh, are having, not only from the point of view of uh, age temperature and, and uh, increase of CO2 concentration, which are the two obviously the most popular and more known, but also through many other variables uh, describing the land atmosphere and the ocean. So we, we are based in the, in the ECB definition of uh, uh, by GCOS. 
which in, in total define uh, uh, 54 ECBs, of which approximately 60% are observable by, by, um, um, by space sensors. So of these 54, we are providing at the moment uh, services for 22 of them, which are grouped in five different groups. So it's an um, uh, atmospheric physics hub, uh, atmospheric composition, ocean, land hydrology and cryosphere, and land uh, biosphere. So one of the requirements is, um, for these services is that we provide data records as long as possible in order to see climate variability, climate trends. So this is one of the things we do, and this is what this figure is trying also to show. And for that, what we do is also operationalize some of the uh, production chains that has been developed under other uh, R&D uh, programs. For example, the ESA CCI program as my previous uh, colleague, Eklema, uh, has described. Um, we also have services for each of these 22 ECBs. We provide not only uh, or generate products of uh, ECBs, but we also provide services. And that means guaranteeing the access to all this data, uh, user support, comprehensive documentation, um, uh, about uh, information about the quality of the product, etc. And of course, again, you see all the logos here. Uh, that means that we need a lot of expertise or to come with expertise of many groups uh, in Europe. And this is what we are trying to, to, to see here with all these logos on the right hand side. Um, as a climate uh, operational survey, uh, what we require is that our products are, first of all, the state of the art. And again, this links with all other programs like the ESA CCI or the UMED SAPS, that they also are long and stable. So the, our CDR, the longest, the better. And this is why we also uh, provide infrastructure necessary to regularly extend it in time, what we call uh, ICTRs. They also provide great uh, products, accessible and traceable. So the access is done to the claim and data store, as I just said before. The documentation also allows the user to, to, to investigate a bit what is the, the, the source, the fundamental data record for what, for, from which these products have been uh, produced. A lot of uh, information available about the quality, independent assessment, etc., and a user support, which is also, um, it permits any user to really uh, query about any uh, problem that have, uh, or any uh, doubt that has about uh, one or other product. So this is the type of information that then we, we are really targeting to obtain. Um, so we really, we are looking at the long-term uh, indicators based on these observations. And they are really important information, especially uh, for the, those has take uh, those decisions, the, the, the policy makers. And that will be an example, for example, for the cryosphere. Uh, for the ice sheets, we've got already data for about more, a little bit more than two decades. Or, or almost three decades, uh, but we already see a clear trend in the loss of ice in the ice sheets, both in the Antarctica and the Greenland ice sheets, which is also equivalent. And this is quite nice for, 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 for the general audience to, to, to understand it, that that product, for example, will be equivalent to 10 times all the uh, amount of water which is stored in one of the a big uh, lake, as is the Lake Garda. Uh, for the glaciers, obviously, the trend is the same. Uh, in this case, we would see like a three times all the ice stored in the European Alps and the sea ice, which is, has more variability. But the important thing is the message we will try to, to, to provide. Another example will be here for soil moisture. We see that there is a, a trend to a decrease or dryness of the soil at the European level when we average it, which especially is important in spring. And but you know I'm not going to take much more time on this. So let's go to the um, value of the hydrogenous um, um, emission. So there has been a lot said in the last uh, couple, uh, well, between yesterday and today about hydrogenous. I think it's for me it's quite important to uh, the fact that we are trying to demonstrate what is the potential of the ENS reflections to derive uh, key information to understand really the functioning of the water cycle through all this uh, set of uh, ECBs and product life of ECBs, which are uh, soil moisture, inundation, wetlands, the, the freeze uh, thaw state, and especially permafrost, and, and the forest uh, biomass. So for the first one, uh, soil moisture, you probably have seen it already. It's already part of our portfolio of ECB products. 
we could only understand long-term data records or, or, and then call it climate data records, of one variable, if we really uh, think about the multi-sensor approach. We really don't have these uh, sensors that are just uh, provided, one single sensor that provide data for the full decades, or, or it would be rather an exception rather than the rule. Um, so for soil monster in particular, there are three different streams of products. So the first stream is the using all the passive data, historical when. So there's data from the from the end of the or from the latest uh, 70s with the SMMR data, and up to today with uh, SMOS and SMAP. Um, we also have a, a second stream, which will be the active data, which is already the data from the 90s up to today with all the Guaranteeing a lot of data in the long term with the metal program through the ASCAT. And another one, which is the combination of all of them, so the active and passive, that I think is a very interesting product because obviously it could overcome some of the problems that either the passive has or either the active has itself. So it makes it a very interesting product. Now, if we look at the future, uh, the first thing is that both uh, SMOS and SMAP, obviously, they both are Elman missions providing very valuable data. The probably the most sensitive um, band for uh, soil moisture, but they are already there for a long time, and there it's not guaranteed that they will be providing or continue providing data in the near future. So there's uncertainty on that. Uh, when we look at the new sentinels, especially um, I'm talking here about CMR and Ross L, there we are probably still looking by the end of this decade a, a possible load. So there it might be a gap there in the middle. And also thinking that the SMOS and then SMAP, the follow-on mission, the possible small mission, they're still in an early phases. And again, there's a lot of uncertainty. So here thinking that hydrogen S might be launched uh, quite soon, relatively soon, in 2024. So then we would probably thinking that uh, there is a really, uh, uh, it could be a filling one a gap uh, which would be left by the L band if the SMOS and the SMAP, they are not there anymore. Or even if they are there, it could be very useful as a really uh, complementary data, increasing the density of observations and possibly providing a very valuable information to even increase the resolution of uh, some of the problems. Um, when we look at um, surface inundation and uh, uh, permafrost, well, they are not yet part of, the, of our portfolio of products. Um, the only information we will have here is about uh, wetlands, but uh, wetlands is simply at the moment provided as an invariant auxiliary field of uh, one of our of our soil moisture product, but it's just based on a on a on a database, the global uh, lake and wetland database. So that what would be desirable to be having a, um, a dynamic map of inland water bodies, especially thinking about uh, uh, bodies which are uh, hidden by a dense canopy where the hydrogen is obviously seems to have, uh, will be very, um, uh, will be sensitive to this type of uh, water bodies at the moment, we don't have observation like this. So that would be very interesting. Um, both, um, both type of uh, products or variables are really interesting for climate. Um, for permafrost, uh, well, it's about the, 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 the green, the big amount of greenhouse gases that could uh, release. If we are talking about a uh, global warming, we're thinking that the, the, the active layer would really get deeper. And that would mean that more release of the houses and we would enter in a positive feedback loop, which would indeed uh, reinforce the global warming and the problems. Um, would also threaten other ecosystems other than as a wetland. And there is also a lot of infrastructure that are constructed over, um, over a, a permafrost. So there's already, because of, the, of this uh, uh, active layer getting uh, deeper, there's already producing a lot of uh, instability of the terrain. Also, as we saw in the previous presentation, uh, erosion in a, a lot of coals. It will also impact the amount of water stored in the surface and the subsurface, the carbon cycle in general, and the vegetation development. And we will talking about wetlands and, ind and inundations. Uh, wetlands are the main source of um, natural uh, methane emissions. It also affect runoff, may affect also the flood events and all the communities that are vulnerable um, in areas which can be uh, flooded and also could impact also all the biodiversity and the ecological system. On it. So in, in, in brief, they really are very important for, uh, for climate and it is in our really in uh, uh, permafrost is uh, one of our um, um, 
priorities for the for really to be um, introduced also in our portfolio in the near future or before the current uh, framework agreement that we've got. Uh, and finally, biomass is also not seen, not part of our portfolio yet. Uh, we've got maps of LAI and FAPAR, but the description of the state of the vegetation could be only complete if we've got um, maps also or a description of the of the biomass. Um, not going to spend much time on the on the importance for climate. I think everybody understands that it's important in this in the carbon cycle and how it stores carbon in vegetation and also how it can really influence all the climate at different scales, in particular, that's a lot of influence in the air temperature and water vapor. So hydrogenase, again, a very important word here is the complementarity. It's a complementarity mission, again, that increase the number of all these observational sensitive biomass. In particular, now we're going to, very soon we'll have uh, launched this uh, PIVAN mission biomass that Clement also talked, and uh, where. And so we will also be able to provide a, a sensitive data in the areas that uh, maybe biomass is not, they will not be able, or for different restrictions, will be able to, to provide. And so I just finished. That's my last slide and so conclusions. So uh, we see that in, in CFTS, we are trying to generate climate records of essential climate variable. This is very important information based on observation, provide key information for policymakers. We have currently providing services for 22 of the CCBs and services I'm talking about you know, access to the, to the um, access to the CBS, uh, documentation, quality control. We also aim to increase the, our uh, offer of CCBs. Uh, permafrost is high uh, a priority for us and biomass also is in our list of candidates. Uh, the benefits of the hydrogenase for us would be, for me, important, very important, is to really demonstrate the feasibility of this, um, of um, navigation signals to monitor the water cycle through these variables, providing a new type of measurement, which is forward scattering. It would be complementary to the others. Again, it's a complementary mission that would really add to all the different type of measurements that we've got already. And also offering a low cost, sustainable space-based system to continue provision of ECB measurement. So looking at the future, we could be also looking at constellation of hydrogen as a small satellite that really warranty having long-term provision of this, of observational sensitive to this. And with that, uh, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joaquin, for your very interesting presentation about the ECB program that you run at ECMWF and how hydrogen S is gonna be fitting in the picture. Um, Paul? Yeah, I don't see any any questions in the in the chat there. The the main ones I had actually you you answered very well towards the end, which was how um hydrogenesis was going to fit into the into the picture here and what benefits you you felt the the satellite could provide. So I thought that was really really good um and very good overview. Um but yeah, if anyone's got any um any questions, please do do drop them in and we can um we can either answer them live or off or, or, or come back to them uh, later after the other speakers as well. Okay, in which case we can move on to the next speaker, who is uh, Wolfgang Wagner. He's a professor of remote sensing at the Technical University of Vienna, and he's going to be talking to us about challenges in the use and validation of satellite soil moisture data. Over to you, Wagner. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so I selected the talk in a way to prepare a little bit uh, on, on how the uptake of the hydrogen as uh, soil moisture uh, data might be in, in, in our community. Um, and so I send you, show you some of the results we have achieved with other satellites. <clears throat> Please excuse my voice. Um, I'm currently sick, so, but I hope uh, that my voice holds on until the end of the, the talk. <clears throat> You have already have seen this, uh, this plot uh, where you see different satellites that can be used for the retrieval of soil moisture. They're all in the microwave domain, roughly in the 1 to 10 gigahertz range. Um, on top, you see the passive sensor line, and on in the bottom, you see the active sensor lines, and uh, some like SMAP, they both have active and passive data. Um, with hydrogen S, we would have basically a new type of sensor. So that could be already from that perspective in the different measurement principle, we could expect different disadvantages and advantages um, that could be then exploited when merging all the different satellite data products 
for example, within the CCI program or within the C3S program, as just introduced by Clement and Joachim. Um, what's, of course, interesting is where are those uh, frequencies uh, of, you know, where are the, the, the frequency bands of the different systems? So with small bands mass, small, small sense map, they have been uh, purposefully selected for the L band, um, which basically also led to a little bit of loss in the spatial resolution. And uh, GNSSR is also in that in that frequency band. So there's a very good sensitivity to soil moisture as we have a very high dielectric constant um, in, in this range. You see, if you go to C band, you lose a little bit of that sensitivity because the dielectric constant of water is going down. Uh, so that's also affecting, of course, if water then is mixing with the soil surface. But overall, still at C band, we have a pretty good signal. Uh, that can go up to maximum, say, 10 um, gigahertz. After that, the electric constant drops up too much so that we have lose uh, very much the sensitivity to soil moisture conditions. Um, the experience we have as uh, Technical University of Vienna is uh, our focus is on the C-band metop advanced catrometer constellation and the Sentinel-1 synthetic aperture radar constellation. Um, these systems work at the frequency of about uh, 5.2 to 5.4 gigahertz. Uh, the main polarization is VV polarization, but uh, now including like also going to other polarizations. And you see those two systems are very complementary to each other in terms of the spatial and temporal resolution. Um, for the ASCAT, the spatial resolution is about 25 kilometer, and we achieve a daily global coverage of about 82%. Um, for Sentinel-1, we have a much, much better spatial resolution in the order of 20 meters, but the repeat coverage is accordingly much worse. Um, so in the best scenario with uh, both Sentinel-1A and Sentinel-1B still in orbit or in orbit and functioning, uh, we had a repeat coverage of over Europe in the order, say, from one to four days uh, and over other continents more in the domain from six to 12 days or even 15 days. Um, so obviously Sentinel-1, great in terms of spatial resolution, but uh, the temporal coverage is not that optimal. Uh, for us, the, the temporal coverage is, is as good as, for example, for SMOS and SMAP, um, but of course the spatial resolution is in the order of these several tens of kilometers. <clears throat> Yeah, like end of year was a bad year for us because uh, both uh, method R was decommissioned and Sentinel 1B unfortunately uh, started to experience troubles was apparently with the energy supply. So this, the satellite is still in orbit, but is currently not delivering data. Um, just showing you how those products look like. So here's, for example, um, ASCAT. Uh, surface soil moisture data set uh, from a couple of days ago acquired from meter B uh, at the 12.5 kilometer grid <laughs> sampling. Um, and you see here the ascending and uh, descending passes. Um, the, if the color is blue, it means there's lots of soil moisture. If the colors are brown, it's basically very dry soil conditions. And over much of the continental areas like Siberia or Canada, we, we don't show data because under those, like right now, those areas are being frozen. So we cannot deliver soil moisture there. The other example is from Sentinel-1 uh, at the time when both Sentinel-1A and Sentinel-1B were still functioning from last September. Um, visualized on the Copernicus Global Land Service Visualizer. And here you already see like one of the challenges you have if you have working with satellite soil moisture data is that even say if you compare morning and evening passes and if you look into different ascending and descending passes, you may have quite big jumps. So here is basically an overlay of all the measurements from that particular day um, on the European map. So again, blue, blue would be uh, very wet conditions, brown would be dry conditions. And obviously some of the shades is due to the visualization, but you can already see that say there's, if like, if, if uh, say the, um, in the evening, you may already have like different soil moisture conditions because for example, rain has fallen in a certain area. 
So the temporal dynamics are very, very important for soil moisture. A crucial aspect, of course, in all the essential variables is that there's a proper validation um, framework and the possibility for doing a validation of the satellite data. In the soil moisture community, we've been very happy that uh, GWEX um, more than 20 years ago started to push towards having uh, establishing an international soil moisture network. And we at Teovin have been very fortunate to get the opportunity to build that um, soil moisture network up. But of course, it lives from all the soil moisture data we get uh, from colleagues from around the world. So you see here, it's quite a good coverage uh, for many, like particularly for the US, um, also coverage for Europe is not too bad. Um, and luckily we're also seeing now a good increase in soil moisture networks also in Asia, um, partly now also in Africa. But of course, those areas are still very sparse. So that means uh, the network is really great and has been used in hundreds, if not thousands of papers for like, for example, training of soil moisture retrievals and validating soil moisture retrievals. But in the way, it's still a very biased data set so that we lack some of the climatic zones and we lack some of the um, biomass regimes. So it would be still great to have more of those data, basically. Um, yeah, and, and the other challenge is that just because you, you have in situ soil moisture data, that doesn't mean that it's straightforward to do the validation because the satellite data come at a much coarser spatial resolution. Uh, they basically sense the very thin uh, surface topsoil conditions um, and they represent a different measurement than in situ measurements. Yeah, in situ measurements are, for example, standard five centimeter under the soil and they just represent a very small um, area around the probe. So there's a huge scale gap between the in situ measurements and the satellite data. Um, so that in the end, you cannot speak of ground truth, but it's a reference data set that you can compare with. Uh, the best is, is if you use in situ data, model data, in combination with the satellite data so that you have like these these three different sites that um, and, and also because models are very good in many cases to check the validity of each of each of them basically um, and the methods we are nowadays applying is um, well people started with simple things like with unbiased root mean square difference um, this is still being widely used um, also correlation is is a very useful measure um, but in recent years, we have been moving towards more complex statistical error models, uh, like, for example, triple collocation, where you basically assume that each data set you bring into the validation framework has a certain error um, against an unknown truth. And you assume uh, that the errors themselves are uncorrelated. Um, also, that is an assumption that has been checked. But yeah, I think there's there's quite good methods now around to do a validation of the data that is for example here summarized in that paper by alexander kuba published um, now two years ago and there's also best practice guidance from the lpv group CO's lpv group maybe with hydrogen ss it might be quite difficult to apply some of the advanced techniques because you often need quite a lot of data before you can start doing these exercises so I'm pretty sure in the beginning, you will be more using things, simple things like uh, the correlation or the unbiased root and square difference. <coughs> also very important, if you do the, the uh, comparison to the in situ data, um, as we basically go across an enormous uh, scaling gap, um, and because we look into data with different temporal and spatial dynamics, um, you need to do some kind of matching before. Yeah, so also there, there have been different techniques being um, developed. And I would just would like to refer you to that book chapter from Luca Bocca, where he's uh, basically summarizing the most common techniques um, applied there. <coughs> to give you an impression how, how challenging this may be, I show you here now um, so much the data from and a site that we have in Austria, about 100 kilometers west to Vienna, where we have had in situ soil moisture measurements from permanent sites and temporary sites. Yeah, so for example, the blue ones are the permanent stations and the green ones have been the temporary stations. 
Yeah, and if you just, for example, plot here five in situ measurements from the same field, um, so it's even the same crop cover, um, you see that there can be tremendous differences in the absolute and uh, temporal dynamics of the in situ soil moisture measurement. And if you're standing in the field um, and you would be judging how would a certain point behave, uh, you possibly have a very hard time to, to predict why one side behaves different than the other. Yeah, in this case, maybe there's a bit of topography in there, but still the variations from point to point is very, very high. So overall, the message is that soil moisture variability on a small scale is also extremely high. Um, and the reason why we are even at all able to compare in situ soil moisture data um, to satellite data at a much coarser resolution is because basically both correspond, uh, respond to the same forcing of precipitation evapotranspiration uh, that creates a certain temporal stability. And that's why we can compare temporal dynamics uh, between the different data sets, but not necessarily absolute values that are much more driven by local scale properties like soil properties or topography. Yeah, so once you have taken out bias, um, biases between different data sets, and if you have applied matching, then you can get time series like this here for the whole sites that I've just shown. Um, so here, for example, we did an compound averaging over 31 in situ stations. Um, and we also had a cosmic ray neutral sensor. There's a great new technology because it's not just representing a very small uh, area around in situ measurement, but they're already like a, a, like a hundred times hundred uh, square meter large area. Um, yeah, and, and you see it compared to ASCAP measurements. Um, in the yellow color, and you see here ASCAT with a very good temporal coverage, and here are some of our first Sentinel-1 retrievals in this red dots. And you see already like Sentinel-1 temporal coverage much poorer than for ASCAT, so it's more difficult to follow exactly the dynamics of the data. Um, and with hydrogen SS, I guess uh, the temporal coverage will be even sparser, so, uh, so the point is that you may miss very important events um, to, to you know, connect you and understand the processes that are ongoing in a certain area. So what are overall the challenges of using soil moisture data for users? I think a very first challenge is for many users is that the data are irregular sampled in space and time. Um, they come in satellites worth uh, in morning and evening passes. Uh, and if, you, if you're a user down in the field, for you, it's kind of more or less arbitrary of how the data come in. At least um, in, in case, say, of, of uh, side looking instruments, uh, the scatrometers and SAR and uh, the passive microwave data, they come in in swath, so there's at least a spatial field. But the next time when the measurement comes is kind of yeah arbitrary in a way. So it, come, it could come uh, already in the evening or it could be coming in two days. Um, we also still have the situation that the highly dynamic surface soil moisture signal is undersampled. Um, basically, we would like to have measurements at least twice a day or even sub daily measurements uh, to capture all different kinds of rainfall events. Um, but the practice is, as I said, like it's typically to have like about one measurement per day for, for the ASCA type of systems to um, every th three to seven days, for example, for Sentinel 1. Another challenge for the uh, users is the rather core spatial resolution of the data. Um, many users would like to hope to have data on a field scale, and you need to do a lot of explaining why this is not possible and why in many cases actually even not even always needed. So I still think there's high value in coarse resolution data, but the users often need to be convinced that this is the case. Yeah, I also said that from the satellite measurements itself, you cannot expect absolute values. Um, the, the, soil, the, the satellite data give you uh, the variable field in space and time. To connect it to absolute value, you need to have soil maps. Um, so basically, it's uh, any kind of soil maps that then ties the satellite data <coughs> to, to the volumetric soil moisture conditions. Um, that's, not also, that's not just the case for ASCAT or Sentinel-1. The same also applies for SMAP or SMOS. They also need to have to kind of this data to get absolute soil moisture values. 
Um, yeah, and also very importantly, if you if you use the satellite data, you stay very much on the surface. And most applications need to have an estimate of the water content in the soil profile. So there's lots of value also to derive further value added product. They try to estimate what's the profile soil moisture content from the satellite data, either via simple schemes like I will show now in a, in a, middle, in a minute, or via data assimilation schemes. And last but not least, what makes working with soil moisture data really use, difficult for users sometimes is that we have retrieval uncertainties that vary in space and time. Because, uh, for example, if you're over a dense uh, forest, also with L band, you don't see through. So uh, over the forest side, you cannot make measurements. Or if you're in an urban area, you obviously you cannot make measurements. Um, so you need to do a masking of a lot of areas where so much measurements are not possible. And worse on top of this, um, there's also dynamic phenomena. Like for some systems, for example, if you have a vegetation growth during summer, if the vegetation uh, canopy becomes too large, you need to do the masking of the data. Or in winter time, it may be because there's frost and snow <laughs> that hinders uh, the accuracy, the, the retrieval of soil moisture values. You're also seeing now, and this, uh, that's why I was also very interested to Mary's uh, presentation about his uh, work in the subsurface scattering areas. You also see that subsurface scattering uh, can have very weird effect on the data in more arid environments. Um, so also these effects may have to be masked before the data can be used. And I can imagine, well imagine, that something like this needs to be done for the hydrogenous S uh, mission. For hydrogenous S, there are some additional challenges on top, <coughs> um, which is the variable footprint. Um, as we will, we'll be working typically with time series. Um, and then we will have like uh, points uh, taken at different locations. So the, the, the matching of these measurements will become not very simple. And then, of course, it also may happen that the footprint size varies. Um, you have, for, for the user perspective, more or less a random sampling in space and time. Um, so even more than the irregular sampling we have with the other system. And unfortunately, for the one satellite, we're going to see significant undersampling, which will not always make it easy to understand um, the processes taking on. Some of the challenges um, I just described can be remedied by having simple methods, for example, our um, so, so called soil water index method, where we try to estimate the profile soil moisture content uh, from the surface soil moisture time series. So basically, we consider a very thin surface layer and the root soil layer. And we basically say the change in this in the root zone is according to the difference of soil moisture conditions from the surface and the profile, um, and that drives basically uh, here the signal if it's if the profile is going up or down. Yeah, the and the soil water index is the discrete version of the simple convolution integral where you convolute the surface soil moisture time series with an exponential filter. Um, this method has, is very practical, very simple, and we also have used it for merging of Sentinel-1 and ASCA data. And also in that sense, it seems a, a very good and simple approach uh, for achieving our objectives. So in that sense, I also would see it as a first, uh, first approach for merging also the hydrogen SS data with other measurements. Here, just see then, like for example, an ASCA Sentinel-1 based soil water index product at the one kilometer resolution daily sampling at a certain point in time, uh, as provided from the Copernicus Global Land Service. That brings me to my last slide. <clears throat> so I think the prospect of having a genus SR multi-satellite constellation is extremely promising. So while, of course, like having just the, the one satellite will not give us the desired data, um, I think, as, as far as my understanding is, it seems to be the only affordable system to provide day round global coverage. Yeah, no other system would be able to give you this kind of um, repeat coverage. Um, and, and that could be like in, indeed really, really interesting. Um, but of course, like if we now think about the concrete phase with hydrogen SS with the one satellite, we'll have these challenges. So you, I'm sure the, the model developers will have 
challenges in training the models. Uh, the validation will not always be that simple. And applications um, to, to have like real impact on applications will not be easy to achieve. Um, we we um, intend to contribute to the mission by fusing the hydrogenous hydro GNSS solar moisture data with some of the other satellite solar moisture data that are out there. And we currently think about using the solar water index method because with this we can bring the data onto a regular space time grid um, and it's also a proxy for the profile solar moisture content which will make it more attractive for some of the applications. I hope you could understand me quite clearly still and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Wolfgang, for your very interesting talk. Yeah. We have a question in the chat. Yeah, thank you, Wolfgang. Yeah, yeah, and particularly thank you for for <laughs> joining us while you're not feeling well as well. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, yeah, we've got we've got one quick question. If your if your voice uh, will will hold up for us, um, the the soil moisture retrieval shown in the time series is that obtained from the Copernicus Global Land Service? Um, I guess so. Yeah, you. I guess you will. Ref that's the question referred to the whole time series, and yes. It Maybe is. as a general comment, uh, like the, the Ascat Soil Moisture product is much more robust and mature than the Copernicus Global Land Service <laughs> because we never had any evolutions. <laughs> and so it's we're still like lagging behind with the, the state of the science uh, some years back and we need still in, to evolve it uh, to, to a better state. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Appreciate that, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I think we're probably, um, yeah, just thank Wolfgang again and uh, move on to the uh, the final uh, the final presentation of this, uh, yeah. this session. Yeah. And no further questions, so I will introduce the last speaker of this session, which is uh, with Mila Dasgarimer of uh, GFZ. And he's going to be talking to us about the role of Genesis I in hydrology and an overview of the recent studies run at uh, GFZ. So Milad, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction, Giuseppe. So yeah, today I'm going to present some of the results on uh, GNSSR. Actually, let me first, uh, yeah, full view. Yeah, great. So today I'm going to present some of uh, the results as you've said uh, for GNSS reflectometry and GNSS reflectometry for hydrological applications. So yeah, my name is Milad Askerimer and I work at German Research Center for Geosciences in Potsdam led by Jens Wickert. And today I'm going to present our results of uh, different projects and uh, many colleagues of mine have contributed to these uh, results. And I would like to, uh, I would like to acknowledge the, uh, they uh, who are listed here. And also here you can see the historical images of uh, NASA satellite, uh, which shows a clear uh, increase in the frequency of wildfire. And uh, my motivation putting this uh, figure is here, which indicates that uh, the importance of uh, using more satellite data for monitoring hydrological processes, especially in vegetated areas. Okay, but why remote sensing of hydroclimate indices? The motivation at least is clear to me because climate change besides the increase in, in the average temperature, it's leading to imbalance precipitation patterns and these uh, irregular patterns either lead to drops, forest aridity, and wildfires, or in case we have uh, extreme precipitation, we might observe inundations and floods. So we are talking about reflections uh, from diff different mediums, land covers like ocean, uh, uh, land, and also the cryosphere. So basically, Genesis reflectometry is able to provide us information on, the, uh, on a variety of hot climate indices in different medium, media. But uh, in this presentation, I'm going to present uh, two examples on first aridity and surface water monitoring vegetated areas. And the other one is uh, discussing the potentials using dual polarization measurements for detecting uh, rain over oceans. So, but first remote sensing of uh, vegetated areas. In this slide, I'm trying just to clarify with this uh, intuitive and simple modeling of the scatterings. So when we are talking about biostatic radar, so we have uh, we expect to have some reflections from the canopies, 
top of the vegetation layer. And also we might have some uh, gathering from the leaf and branch reflectance uh, and some of the signals are able to penetrate deeper and are reflected from the ground. And we have also some blocking by the tongue and uh, some of the energy of the signal might be able to uh, get deeper into the, into the ground and provide us information about the root zone. Of course, the main uh, variable which controls the uh, penetration depth is the signal frequency or wavelengths. And since we are talking about L band signals, we expect to have most of the reflections from the leaf and branch reflections and ground uh, and, uh, and also the ground. And uh, since the reflection inten intensity uh, from these areas are mainly controlled by the electrical properties of the media, which in turn is controlled by the moisture content, then we might be able to detect forest moistures and also aridity in these areas. Okay, we have done a study, it's an example here. And I would like to acknowledge uh, Mina Rahmani because I'm going to present uh, his uh, actually studies, uh, sorry, her PhD studies here. So it is in a study over uh, Amazon area. And you can see that we have a grid, the 30, 36 kilometer grid uh, observations of thickness which is co-located with its map and also GPM precipitation. And the land cover, according to MODIS, is broadleaf and leaf forest. So here you see the time series of the observations, thickness NBRCS in orange, as well as the, um, sorry, NBRCS in black, as well as the its map soil moisture in orange. So the fact is, is uh, it, it is obvious that there are some trends between the ground soil moisture and as the vegetation layers, and also uh, Cygnus NBRCS. And we have also highlighted the uh, wildfires based on uh, MODIS. And, on the, and in the lower panel, we can also see the vegetation water content and also uh, surface temperature. The fact here is that in February and March, we are uh, actually experiencing an arid, uh, uh, actually we can see an arid area. So, and of course we have also some wildfires as MODIS reports and also you can see the wildfires in the Sentinel data. But the point here is that uh, these, these uh, measurements are actually corresponding to the minimum value of the NBRCS, which means that we are experiencing or we are witnessing an arid, data, uh, arid environment. But on the other hand, it uh, indicates that most of the reflections that we are receiving uh, from, uh, from by Cygnus is uh, from the ground and not by the vegetation or vegetation layers. So when, the, when, we, when we have the precipitation season and starts, so from April to August, then we can see that we have the recharge of the rivers and inland water bodies appear. And we can of course also use the NSS reflectometry measurements to detect inland water bodies and recharge and discharge and as well as inundation of the uh, inundations in the area. So, but the other fact here is that uh, when we compare SMAP with Cygnus and BRCS. We can see that uh, SMAP shows kind of saturated uh, behavior. However, maybe it's not a fair comparison because we are aware of the differences in the uh, instrument and also technique. And however, uh, still MBRCS shows some response to the precipitation events. And then we have, we can see that from August to November, we are uh, witnessing a less amount of precipitation and probably soil is drawing out and that's why we see such a decrease in NBRCS uh, values. We went further and also we, uh, we are showing here that uh, the average NBRCS values in the area, Amazon area. And the striking fact here is that when we have the high, higher number of wildfires in these cells, as you can see, they correspond to the areas that we have the lowest value of the NBRCS. Again, it is an evidence that probably we have most of the reflections from the ground rather than the vegetation layers. However, I would highlight that the mechanism is much more complicated. And uh, we have also seen in some areas, the uh, intensity of the intentions or, uh, reflections are mainly controlled by the um, vegetation water content where we have a dense vegetation uh, cover. So, Let's move on. At least it is a 
preliminary uh, evidence that we are able to use GNSS reflectometry data to detect arid areas. And you can see also the, how the patterns uh, match in these figures. So, but I talked also about the uh, inland water bodies in vegetated areas, uh, specifically in Amazon region. So we tried also to detect the inland water bodies and the mechanism is uh, the mechanism behind is clear because sickness sweeps the land and as the DPMs reach the water surface, we have the coherent reflections and the sudden increase in the, uh, in the power of the DDMs. So basically using a trackwise processing algorithm to detect anomalies, I would like to highlight the trackwise processing because I think that it's, it's a, a good approach to detect many geophysical parameters such as inland water bodies. Then we might be able to detect and classify if you, are, if you have reflections from land or either or from water surface. So we applied a machine learning technique to be more specific, unsupervised uh, machine learning aiming clustering. And here you can see that how it classifies the reflections, which creates uh, the image here. And we can see also the inundations near the river. And the other fact here, here is that spatial resolution that we are getting from this product. So for example, here you can see that we, we are also able to uh, detect the small and narrow branches of the river in addition to the main body of the river and the lakes shown here. Let's move on to the next application, which is uh, rain over uh, ocean or calm oceans or sea. So the idea originates from 2018 when we used TDS1 measurements <clears throat> showing that biostatic gradle cross section shows uh, respond systematically to rain rate at winds lower than six meters per second. And we provided a plausible explanation for this based on a recent scattering theory that the rain splash is detected at low wind speeds, in this case, lower than six meters per second, generally, actually. So, but we would like to pose this question that can dual polarization measurements be more efficient for ray detection? To answer this question, answer this question is important since SSDL hydrogen SS will operate in dual polarization. And we might, we might do, uh, uh, we would like to explore the potentials of hydrogenesis and how the dual polarization might help us, at least in this application. So to answer the question, we need to clarify the physics. So the, the intensity of the reflections over ocean is uh, controlled by the electric permittivity of the water, which is in turn uh, a function of the surface salinity and temperature. And at least in this range of surface salinity and temperature, you can see that <laughs> the reflections are mainly controlled by the sea surface salinity. But the striking fact here is that when we have a change in the sea surface salinity, we can see the change both in RCP power and LSCP power, but, but in different directions. An increase in the sea surface salinity increases the power in the RCP, whereas it decreases the power in LSCP. So by combining the observations in different polarizations, we can see a larger discrepancy and as a result, uh, more detectable signatures in the Genesis reflectometry measurements. So, but why it is important to monitor a uh, sea surface salinity changes? Because rain alters the SSS as the uh, fresh water accumulates uh, over the surface. As you can see in this model, how the sea surface salinity is altered at different uh, rain rates and duration dictated by D. So similarly, since uh, the sea surface salinity is changing, we can see also the change uh, of the RCP power and LSCP power over the rain rate and at different durations, but in different directions, which is important here. And also again, when we combine measurements in LSCP and RCP polarizations, then the discrepancy would be larger and potentially might be, we might use this uh, discrepancy to detect salinity change over ocean or sea. So we did also an empirical analysis using uh, ground based station, UF uh, at uh, on Solar Space Observatory. And here you can see the antenna receiving both LSCP and RCP signals. And we included only the measurements when the uh, wind is uh, blowing from the coast side in order to use the shielding effect of the coast to guarantee that uh, the sea is calm enough to take precipitation. So here in this uh, plot, you can see uh, the uh, interferometric patterns 
in RCP and LCP in two cases, left no rain, right during rain. And you can see the wind speed is more or less uh, similar in two cases. And when there is no rain, we can see the regular pattern of the RCP uh, amplitude increasing, uh, sorry, decreasing over elevation angle, whereas the LCP amplitudes are increasing over the elevation angle. However, when we compare the amplitudes in these two cases, we can see that, yeah, so the amplitudes are smaller here. Probably something is happening, although the wind speed uh, is slightly uh, lower compared to the case of uh, the case that there is no rain. So the other fact here is that when we compare this area, so when we have an uh, increase in the rain rate, we can see a systematic uh, shrinking of the uh, amplitudes, both in LSCP and RSCP. However, in LSCP, it is more evident. We went further to uh, here you can see the average power both in RCP and LSCP. And you can see the discrepancy of the average power during rain and during no rain is, is getting larger at higher elevation angles. This indicates that these, uh, these effects that we are witnessing is mainly associated with the roughness change as the simulations also here confirm the, this behavior. But I talked about the polarimetric observations. So we use the polarimetric observations in an inverse sense to retrieve the standard deviation of the surface heights as well as sea surface salinity. So then we can see that a steady increase of the sea surface uh, uh, roughness over the rain rate, whereas uh, sea surface uh, salinity over the rain rate no sh shows no change up to 10 millimeter per hour. However, then we can see a decrease of the sea surface salinity at uh, extreme precipitations. However, since we are talking about an extreme event, extreme events here, the data is sparse here. Mainly, maybe we need more data to confirm this trend. Let's move on to the conclusions. Um, GNSS reflective material offers potentials for the remote sensing of hydroclimate indices over land and ocean. So we have the evidence that uh, measurements response to the forest moisture. Uh, in some cases, the uh, um, at least in this case that I showed you that we have the reflections on the, on the ground um, uh, uh, cover, and it is mainly sensitive to the soil moisture. However, we have some areas that based on the leaf area index, when we have a dense vegetation, then we can see that dominant signature is uh, from the vegetation water content. And uh, Genesis reflective metric measurements uh, could help us uh, aid wildfire and flood burning systems. And also GNSS R maps the dynamics of land water bodies. It is, uh, I, I could say that it is a well-established uh, application of GNSS reflectivity over land, at least uh, when we apply machine learning techniques and it shows a great potential and we might use dual polarization measurements uh, to detect precipitation and salinity change uh, over oceans, such as those provided by uh, such as those will be provided by hydro GNSS soon. And also uh, the ground experiment confirms uh, the potentials. I would like to take the opportunity here to invite you to the, uh, actually we could see the importance of the scientific methods in processing GNSS uh, reflectometry measurements. And uh, I take the opportunity to invite you to the first workshop on data science for GNSS remote sensing, which is going to take place in Potsdam. And we look forward to seeing you. Thank you very much also for, uh, for your attention. Thank you, Milad, for your interesting presentation and also for the invitation to the workshop you're going to be running in Potsdam. Uh, Thank you, Milad. Yeah, does anyone have any questions for Milad? Um, maybe while we, we, oh, there's a, let me just there's see, has one come up? Um, the RHCP signals are going to be very weak at in incidence angles greater than 35 degrees. Is it still useful? Mm -hmm. it is, uh, yeah, I didn't uh, mention the role of geometry on the portion of the LSCP and RCP power, but of course the uh, portion of these uh, powers are, uh, is dependent on the geometry and in incidence angle. But in general, yeah, because we did the experiments on a, a ground-based uh, station, since we, so far we don't have any uh, genesis reflective material in dual polarization and hydrogenesis would be the first one. Uh, I can comment at least on my experiment on the ground base. Uh, we can see the, 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 the uh, measurements in RHCP, but of course, uh, most of the uh, reflections that we have, if we are using uh, uh, 
downlooking antenna would be in a incidence angle of, of in a medium range of the incidence angle that, and expect uh, the measurement expect the uh, uh, contributions both from RSCP and LSCP. I think it would be still useful. Okay, so you think it could be it could be still translatable to a satellite application? In yes. Other words, yeah. Yes. So that's okay. Oh yeah, and we've got another one. Sensitivity to precipitation seems strong for rain rates greater than ten millimeters for several hours. What are the chances of this type of phenomena to occur? So mm -hmm. How often, you know, does it does how often does that happen? Uh, the ten millimeters greater uh, than ten millimeters. Uh, probably a plausible explanation for this is. Uh, since when we have uh, not an extreme precipitation, the sea has the time, you know, to mix again well, you know, the water, and then the water doesn't have enough time, you know, to accumulate well on the surface and be detectable in Genesis reflections. But when we have an extreme precipitation, since uh, it's, it's a in a rapid, uh, you know, it's, it's a quick uh, phenomenon, I would say, then the sea uh, doesn't have enough time, you know, to mix. The water, and then we have this accumulation of fresh water, and probably that can be an explanation for this. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah, and just as a follow up to the previous one, um, they they're just asking if it depends on the purity of the transmitted signal as well. I guess that's also taken into account in your experiments, in that you're using the. the... Yeah, I, I think the assumption here is that the the, the, the transmitted signals are pure in uh, RC. And uh, I, I'm not sure actually on this. Maybe we are, uh, but but uh, I, I do not think that we have such fluctuations uh, significantly, at least, in the transmitted signals of GPS. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. And that's yeah, yeah, particularly good as uh, I'm sure everyone's uh, <laughs> looking to get to lunch. So good that, that had some questions there as well. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I think that's we're now at the end. We're only a little bit over, so um, I, I assume that we'll probably restart at the same sort of time. But maybe Pete can. Uh, yeah, can I just would like to well. just would like to thank all the speakers and also all the people attending for their attention. And uh, over to Pete then. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> yes, thank you, everybody, uh, particularly the uh, presenters with their preparations for some really uh, useful. Uh, commentary on potential use of uh, hydro-GNSS. I think it, it, it clearly outlines the, the benefits of uh, two or more satellites uh, for the benefits of the scientific return. So it's good to understand that.